This is Dr. David Bauer in his teaching on inductive Bible study. This is session number 11, segment survey, James 1, and detailed observations on James 1, 5 through 8. We want now to uh, apply, really, what we've said regarding uh, segment survey to the first chapter of James. Actually, the uh, sample uh, survey of the book of Jude almost functions as a, uh, a, an example of the survey of a segment because Jude is, of course, only one uh, chapter long. Uh, but we do want to uh, go ahead and look at the first chapter of James. Um, this uh, segment is um, a bit more complicated. It's not as straightforward as most segments are. Uh, and... Um, so, uh, it will, what the survey of this segment will take a, will require uh, just a little bit more in the way of explanation. On the surface, of course, James seems simply to move from one thing to another uh, almost randomly uh, here in uh, the first chapter of James. But actually, a careful reading of this segment uh, does reveal a, uh, a very, a very uh, a careful uh, and um, and effective sort of structuring. Now, again, we begin with the uh, paragraph titles, uh, which will help us by way of association to recall uh, the contents of the segment without recourse to the text. But, of course, as we mentioned, uh, at the heart of, of segment survey is structural analysis, which involves both the identification of main units and subunits, linear development, breakdown, and then also uh, major structural relationships operative in the segment as a whole. Now, uh, I note, uh, I observe a, a, a couple of things uh, here. Uh, for one thing, I notice uh, that uh, the first paragraph, that would be verses 2 through 4, uh, and the fourth paragraph, which would be verses 12 through 15, talks about uh, trials and testing. So it, it may very well be that there is a connection then between verses 2 through 4 and verses 12 through 15. I notice also that in verse 16 there is reference to uh, Deception, he says in verse in one sixteen, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. In one twenty two, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And verse twenty six, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this man's religion is vain. Uh, and in fact, in verse nineteen, he says, know this. So there seems to be an emphasis throughout uh, verses 16 through 27 upon not being deceived, but rather, by way of contrast, knowing or understanding. So it may very well be, then, that verses 2 through, through 15 belong together and have to do really, uh, uh, are linked together uh, by this notion of trials and testing and the like, and that verses 16 through 27 uh, are bound together by, by uh, the repetition of this theme of uh, avoiding deception and, uh, and embracing knowledge. I notice, too, uh, that if, in fact, there may be a shift between verses uh, 15 and 16, that the last paragraph in, of the first portion of uh, James 1, that would be verses 12 through 15, and the first paragraph of the second portion of James, which would be of James one, which would be verses sixteen through eighteen, involves is, involves what God does give and what God does not give. So we notice in verses twelve through fifteen, blessed is a, is a man who endures trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. 
But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it uh, has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. He continues, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good endowment and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth from the word of, by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So, all that to say is that, all that to say, verses 2 through 15 may be bound together by a common concern, at least at the beginning and end, for how one ought to relate to trials and temptations. Verses 16 through 27 may be bound together by a common concern for avoiding deception and embracing, by way of contrast, knowledge. And these two, may, these two portions, these two halves of James 1, may be linked, uh, really, um, uh, together, uh, uh, be joined together, uh, insofar as uh, the uh, last passage of the first part of James 1 and the first passage or first paragraph of the second part of James 1 has to do with a contrast between what God does not give and what God does give. He does not give, he is not responsible for temptation, but he rather gives every good and perfect gift. So we might chart it this way, and I, I have to uh, I warn you that this is a kind of a busy chart, but uh, we note here uh, that it really, it really moves in this direction here, around uh, this way, uh, and uh, begins really with, uh, with as I say, uh, verses 2 through 4, uh, rejoice in trials. The word here in Greek, incidentally, is perismos, uh, rejoice in trials, and with an emphasis upon steadfastness. We note here, too, in the next paragraph, verses 5 through 8, uh, that he once again emphasizes the notion of, 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 of steadfastness. He talks about not being steadfast, about being unstable, about not enduring. So, blessed is a man who endures, who pamene, uh, trials. Then he talks about here, about the person who, uh, who uh, asks for wisdom without wavering. That is to say, is steadfast in terms of, of his or her asking for wisdom. In verses 9 through 11, uh, he talks about those who endure uh, trials. Once again, picking up on the notion of endurance here, hupamane, endure, endure here, and picking up once again on the notion of trials, uh, perismos, uh, rejoice in trials, uh, and then talking about uh, enduring trials and temptations. Again, the same word. So you have really a binding. And then also in verses 12 through 15, he talks about the character of trials and temptations and talks about, about a blessed is the one who endures. So we note that there is a common concern here in verses 2 through 15 in every one of these paragraphs upon endurance or upon steadfastness. And in the... Uh, in this paragraph here, verses 2 through 4, in this paragraph here, verses 9 through 11, and in this paragraph here, verses 12 through 15, there is a concern for, uh, for, uh, for uh, and the whole notion of endurance. So it's quite clear that verses 2 through 15 are bound together over against verses 16 through 27 by uh, a, a common concern for, with, with endurance, Stability, unwavering, that's found in each one of these paragraphs, and a common concern also for uh, proper response to trials and temptations. As we mentioned uh, a few moments ago, uh, the common concern here, uh, in the, uh, one common concern that binds verses 16 through 27 together, is a concern for avoiding deception. We have this in this paragraph uh, here, um, uh, where he says, uh, of course, uh, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Um, uh, we have it also here in this paragraph, verses 22 through 25. Um, uh, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And again here in verses 26 and 27, if any one thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart. 
Uh, so uh, we have, as I say, deception, 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 and by uh, way of contrast, know this, binding this material together. Now, another thing that binds verses 16 through 27 together is a common concern for the word. Uh, in, uh, in uh, again, verses 16 through 18, uh, he says in verse 18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. And then in verse 21, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, etc. So once again, you have word, 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 deception, 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 knowledge. Quite clearly, then, uh, 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 the segment uh, breaks uh, between verses 15 and 16. Now, as we mentioned also a few moments ago, this last paragraph here, the final paragraph of the first section here of James 1, and the first paragraph of this second section of James 1 involves a contrast pertaining to God. In verses 12 through 15, he makes a point that God is not responsible for temptation. God does not give temptation. In verses 16 through 18, by way of contrast, contrast, he talks about what God does give, that every good and perfect endowment is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And he talks really about, and then he goes ahead and, and says, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, indicating that God, that, 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 that God is responsible for all good and perfect gifts, and especially the gift of the word. God does not give temptation, but he does give every good and perfect gift, and especially the best gift of all, perhaps, James is suggesting, and that is the gift of the word. So what we have then in verses 2 through 15 is the triumph of the Christian life over and through trials and temptations. And in verses 16 through 27, uh, uh, he says uh, 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 here, uh, with what you have here then is by living according to the reality and resources of the word, the emphasis upon doing and hearing the word, do not be deceived in terms of completeness or perfection. Now, uh, beyond that, we note that in this first portion, this first uh, unit of James 1, uh, he, he emphasizes the, the, the role of wisdom. He indicates that it is important to ask for wisdom without wavering, whereas here, uh, in uh, this paragraph, in, really in verses 22 through 25, he talks about the role of the word and what the word is able to do, what wisdom is able to do for us and what the word is able to do for us. It's, this is suggestive then uh, that in this first portion of James, 1, uh, of James 1, wisdom is the means for responding appropriately to, uh, to uh, trials and temptations and uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, is uh, the means of the kind of steadfastness that, that is required uh, in the surrounding paragraphs here in, in this first portion of chapter, of chapter 1. Likewise, uh, what he says with regard to the word and the operation of the word here, what the word is able to do for us, here he talks about what wisdom is able to do, what the word is able to do for us suggests that the word is the means of avoiding deception and of embracing knowledge. So, triumph of the Christian life over and through trials and temptations by living according to wisdom. Here, by living according to the reality and resources of the word, with emphasis upon doing and hearing the word, this will lead to not being deceived but rather embracing a kind of knowledge uh, that uh, uh, will uh, overcome. Now, in terms of structural relationships, then, uh, we have 
of uh, course, uh, contrast with generalization and particularization. Uh, we note here that the character of and relationship between trials and temptation and deception in terms of God's activities. As to say, with regard to God, and this has to do, of course, with the, that great central section there, verses, uh, fifth, verses 12 through 18, God, regarding temptation, does not tempt. This really involves a general statement regarding trials or temptations in 1, 12 through 15, which he goes ahead, uh, which, he, which, uh, which uh, really is the generalization of the particulars of verses uh, 2 through 11. With regard to deception, with God, with regard to deception then, uh, he makes it clear that God, that, that, one, that we should not be deceived. God is the only giver of all good and perfect gifts, especially the gift of the word. So that verses 16 through 18 involve general statements with regard to God's, uh, to uh, general statements with regard to, uh, to uh, deception, which he goes ahead and particularizes in verses 19 through 27. Now, beyond that, of course, we raise questions with regard to this, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, we won't actually take time to uh, read these questions, but here they are. We also have a recurring instrumentation. We mentioned wisdom seems to be the means toward the, of the, toward the end of overcoming trials and temptations. That is, using trials and temptations for spiritual development rather than being destroyed by them. How, in fact, can we uh, overcome trials and temptations. How can we use trials and temptations for spiritual development rather than being destroyed by them? It is by, way, it is by means of the wisdom that God gives. That comes from God. Then, of course, he, uh, uh, hearing and doing the word is the means for the end of avoiding the pitfalls of various deceptions. And, of course, there may be a connection between wisdom and the word here, between this means, which is the dominant means in the first half of James 1, and this means, which is a dominant uh, means of the second half of James 1. And, again, we raise questions with regard to that. And uh, then we also have here, really, uh, as I, we mentioned before, the recurrence of causation and substantiation, the hortatory pattern. We note that the exhortations here really focus on maxims or knowledge, what one is to know or understand, versus specific behavioral demands that we have, really, uh, in the rest of the book. And then uh, we have also a recurrence of contrast, the two ways here, which we saw in the book as a whole, but it takes on rather specific form here, uh, a contrast between wise and stable, having to do, which really uh, involves perfection, on the one hand, versus unwise or unstable, which involves chaos and division, on the other. So those who ask for wisdom in faith, not doubting, will receive. Over against those who petition God in doubt, who are double-minded, who are unstable, will not receive. Also on the side of the wise are the low, the low, lowly, the poor and the oppressed, who uh, uh, will exalt in their, uh, who, who, will, who will be exalted and who will endure. The wealthy, on the other hand, characterized by humiliation and passing away. Doers and hearers of the word is contrasted to those who hear the word only. And true and undefiled religion is contrasted with vain religion. And again, uh, we have these uh, questions that we could Ask key verses or strategic areas. Of course, these represent major structural relationships that we identified in 1, 12 through 18. Um, represents contrast, we mentioned there, uh, with generalization and particularization. Um, that has to do with the contrast between what God does not give or provide, temptation, what he does give or provide, um, uh, good gifts, and especially the gift of the word um, there. And, of course, as we mentioned, verses 12 through uh, 15 generalize what he has said more specifically with regard to endurance, 
and with regard to trials and temptations in verses 2 through 11. And, of course, verses 19 through 27 particularize uh, the general statements that he makes there with regard to deception and to the word in verses 16 through uh, 18. So that really uh, uh, is, is what, at least the way I would view the uh, segment here uh, in, uh, in James chapter 1. As I say, it is somewhat subtle. Uh, this kind of subtlety of, of, of argument was something that, uh, that would be expected and uh, the readers uh, in that, in that, at that time and in that culture and subculture would have, uh, would have uh, been uh, familiar with would be somewhat easier for them to pick up on this than, as I say, for modern Western people uh, who uh, approach this and they see a lot of randomness. But as I say, uh, you have these repetitions here uh, that bind the first half of James 1 together, other repetitions that bind the second half of James 1 together, uh, this business of wisdom um, being uh, the means of the exhortations you have in the first half of James, the word, again, the gift of wisdom being the means of, uh, of fulfilling the demands in the first uh, half of James 1, God's gift of the word being the means of fulfilling the demands in the second half of James 1, with the hinge there in verses 12 through 18, contrast what God does not give, temptation, that of course links in with the temptation theme in the first half of the segment, what God does give, every good and perfect gift, especially the gift of the word, which uh, ties in with the emphasis on the word that you have uh, in the second half of James. Well, uh, we mentioned the, uh, uh, in, in an earlier segment uh, that there are three levels of observation. We've talked about the first two. That is, to say, the survey of the book. And so we've looked at the survey of the book of Jude and the survey of the, of the epistle uh, to James, book survey. We've talked about, this, about the survey of segments, and we've just uh, now um, examined uh, the survey of uh, James chapter 1. Uh, the uh, third level, as you remember, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of observation uh, pertains, to, uh, the, uh, pertains to detailed, uh, fo- uh, to, uh, to uh, a focused observation of details. And focused observation of details uh, may involve um, either detailed observation or detailed analysis. Um, and we want to look at, uh, at each of those and give an example of each of those possibilities uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, a focused observation of details. Now, we begin really with um, uh, the possibility of what we call a detailed analysis. This is one, this is one possibility for, um, uh, for doing a detailed, uh, 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 a focused observation on the details of, of a passage. Uh, and in detailed, um, uh, a detailed observation, uh, we actually move through the, through the passage uh, verse by verse. We begin by making observations that pertain to the verse as a whole, and then, having done that, we move through the verse uh, we move through the verse clause by clause, uh, uh, making clauses whole observations as relevant, uh, and uh, then making observations of individual. Uh, terms or phrases within uh, the clause. Now, in terms of detailed observation, there are essentially uh, five types of observations that are relevant to make. Uh, The first type of observation are are what we call termal observations. 
These are observations regarding, regarding terms, obviously enough. That is to say, observations regarding, uh, regarding uh, individual words. Now, uh, there are a couple possibilities as far as what one can do in uh, term observation. Uh, one is to note the root of the word. Uh, that is to say, the, 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 uh, one might say, the dictionary form of the word. Uh, this is this often, uh, and so, uh, uh, for example, if you have, uh, let's say, the expression, uh, he sang, uh, the root would be uh, to sing. Now, let me just say here that if you are able to make use of Greek, uh, this is where you can bring in uh, the Greek in a, in a very helpful and significant way. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, and I mentioned this, if you don't know Greek, that's okay, but if you have the word eothen, uh, you might know in terms of root that this comes from erkomai. Uh, this really nails down uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what's involved uh, in the term itself, the lexical uh, form of the word. Uh, also, the inflection of the word. Now, inflection has to do really with changes in the form of a word that indicate its grammatical meaning and significance. Changes in the form of the word that indicate its grammatical meaning and significance. So in the case of he sang, uh, this would be the third person singular, simple past or past preterite, active indicative of to sing. Uh, case of Aothen, uh, this of course is, uh, this is, uh, this is a third person singular, uh, aorist active indicative of uh, erkomai. So uh, uh, this, and, and we're going to come, when we look at interpretation, we're going to note the significance of inflections, but anyway, the root, the basic uh, root of the word, uh, the uh, inflection of the word, uh, changes in the word that indicate its grammatical meaning and, uh, and significance, uh, and also the type of term. Is a term, does a term seem to be used literally or figuratively? Uh, also, a second type of observation are grammatical observations. These are observations regard, regarding grammatical function, really regarding syntax of words or phrases. Things like subject, predicate, prepositional phrase, those kinds of things. Now, I don't think it's really necessary or usually helpful to go into a great deal of detail in grammatical analysis of syntax, but sometimes uh, these um, observations are quite significant when it comes to interpretation. Um, Luther uh, is reported to have said, although I've not been able to track this down in Luther's own works, uh, that the gospel is in the prepositions. Uh, and that, but that is sometimes the case. Sometimes uh, grammatical uh, features of a sentence are extremely important for understanding what's there, and they have even theological significance. I can think of, uh, of uh, passages just now uh, whose interpretation really is very much affected by, uh, by, uh, by the grammatical structure of, this, of, of the sentence. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of the, of the Great Com Commission, the famous Great Commission in Matthew uh, 28, uh, 19 through 20a. Go make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Uh, it's, it's important to note that really uh, you have one main verb uh, in the Great Commission, which is make disciples. In Greek, incidentally, that's just one word, mathetusete, make disciples. It is preceded by a, a participle. Really, in the Greek, it's an aorist participle, go, or having gone and is followed by two present participles, baptizing and teaching, so that the grammatical structure of the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19 through 28, suggests that the, that, that the main issue, the center of that, of, that, of that statement, is the verb make disciples. And it raises a question then as to how the participle, the aorist participle, go, relates to the main verb, and how the uh, present participles, um, uh, baptizing and teaching, uh, relate to uh, the, uh, uh, the main verb there. 
So it points, as I say, to the center of that claim as well as to uh, the ways in which uh, other significant terms in the Great Commission uh, relate to uh, that central concern with make disciples. <clears throat> now, a further um, now, let me just say that that both regard to with regard to thermal observations and, grammat and grammatical observations, um, um, most people to a day are not are not skilled in the, in this kind of grammatical analysis. Uh, they're somewhat weak in terms of uh, <coughs> of uh, these kinds of aspects of English language skills. If, of course, you, you know Greek, this is not a problem. You would work with the Greek, and this is one reason, of course, why it's important to, uh, uh, to uh, know Greek. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, I would like to uh, indicate two works, uh, two books that might be of help to you. There is, first of all, a book by Francis Brown, um, B-R-A-U-N, this is just a very little book, Francis Brown. And the title of this book is uh, English Grammar for Language Students. Uh, it, really, it really discusses, in a very straightforward way, major parts of speech. Uh, another another uh, uh, book that we'll, I'll mention is uh, uh, a Harbrace uh, College Handbook. Harbrace College Handbook. It's a first-year college primer on Engl on on uh, on uh, English grammar deals both with issues of the inflection of words and also of uh, grammatic of syntax of grammatical uh, matters of gr grammatical function of words or phrases within uh, a sentence things like subject predicate direct object object of the preposition these kinds of things a third possible type of observation uh, here in detailed observation. Uh, is uh, structural. The same kinds of structural relationships that we saw operative at the level of the book as a whole and at the level of the segments of the segment as a whole are present in paragraphs in sent within sentences and even within uh, within clauses. It's important to be structure conscious, always to be aware of of uh, of these uh, structural relationships at whatever level. Uh, you're working here, of course, at the level of the sentence or, or the paragraph. A further type of observation is logical observation. This involves, as I mentioned, observations regarding the logical function of a term or statement. That is, the type of meaning expressed by the term or statement. The type of meaning expressed by the term or statement. Another way of putting this is the issue that the term or statement has to do with. If, for example, you, you, you have the word in your passage, you have the word all, you know that that pertains to the issue of scope. All is inclusive scope. Some is partial scope. None is exclusive scope. Or if you have, uh, for example, the phrase, a great multitude of people, that points really to extent, and more specifically to numerical extent that deals with the issue of numerical extent. Or, uh, and, and, or, of course, you have, as I say, so there you have a couple of examples. As a matter of fact, with regard to these uh, logical observations, uh, let, let me, uh, uh, let's look at a passage from John, uh, chapter 9 here, and just note the kinds of logical observations we can make on this passage. John 9, 1 uh, through uh, 4. Well, actually, let's just say 1 through 3. John 9, 1 through 3. As he, just to say, Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Should have, once again, had Bibles open uh, as we look at this. So what kinds of logical observations might we make on this passage? Note the first phrase. 
as he passed by. That points to the issue of manner of encounter. And more specifically, we note that the manner of, account of, of, of encounter was, on the one hand, casual, as he passed by. On the other hand, was apparently unanticipated. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, that business of its being um, apparently unanticipated really stands in tension with verse 3. Jesus says, it was not that this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. So in other words, this apparent, apparently unanticipated encounter in verse 1 stands in tension with the, with, uh, stands in tension with the, with, with, with the, with the divine intention to uh, to make this man's blindness an opportunity, really, for the works of God being made manifest in him when, when Jesus will heal him. Also in verse 1, we see, uh, he's, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. That has to do with perception, Jesus' perception. Note that Jesus sees, but that this man is blind. There are, of course, other ways that he could have expressed uh, uh, this encounter over against uh, he saw a man. He could have said, for example, he met a man, or he came upon a man, or he encountered a man. But he saw a man blind from birth. Then the phrase, blind from birth. This points to his condition. And more specifically, all these are logical observations identifying the, the issues that are involved here in these words or phrases. Blind from birth, as I say, points to the man's condition, and it, and, it, and, it, and it expresses the extent of his condition, the extent or the duration of his condition from birth, and the character of his condition, unaddressable and hopeless. And then, in verse 2, and his disciples asked him, what you have here is interrogative reaction. This is the interrogative reaction on the part of the disciples. Interrogative having to do with question. And his, the disciples respond to this situation with a question. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What you have here then is a putting forth of limited alternatives. Limited alternatives. And the focus of their, of their reaction, their interrogative reaction, where they put forth limited alternatives, involves both the issue of agency, well, involves really, first of all, the issue of agency. Who sinned? This man or his parents? Really, human agency. What, what human or which human was, is, was responsible for this man's condition? And I say, I say that it really has to do with limited alternatives, they, uh, that is to say, uh, it is either, they say, his parents or, or, or he. And what they do is they assume a causal connection from human moral failure. That is to say, this blindness was a result of human moral failure, either on the part of his parents or on the part of the man. Who sinned? This man or his parents? Now, at this point, we really have a kind of temporal puzzle. Again, this is a logical observation. Don't you have a, a kind of, of, um, of problem here uh, within uh, this uh, statement? Especially the problem is, has to do with, with this first alternative that they mentioned. Uh, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? They talk about his blindness, the blindness of this man who was, who was, who was blind at birth, who was born blind, being the result of his sin. How then could blindness at birth be the result of this man's sin? Are they suggesting that, 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 that he sinned in a previous life? Or that somehow uh, the sin in his life was retroactive? But anyway, there's a tension here. It's not at all clear how, how the sin of this man could have caused him to be born blind. Now, Jesus answers here, 
uh, in verse 3. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. What we have here then is a negative repudiation on the part of Jesus and a positive correction. He begins by indicating negatively what it was not. It was not, he says, that this man sinned or his parents. That really is a kind of repudiation, you see, of their limited alternatives, of their possible explanation. But by way, then, of positive correction, what is the case, a corrective, then, to their perspective, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Jesus then indicates that the issue is not cause, is not human cause, but divine purpose. The issue is not what caused this man's blindness. The issue is the purpose of this man's blindness. It's not, to be, it's not a matter of, of what humans did as cause, but, but, but what God purposes in terms of divine intention. So, as I say, those are, are simply some of the possible uh, uh, types of uh, logical observations uh, that, uh, uh, that we might make on, on a passage. Now, um, we also have uh, uh, contextual observations. These are observations regarding the relationship between elements in the verse being observed and things found in the surrounding material, especially in the immediate context. What are the connections between what we have in this passage and what we have then in the immediate uh, context? Uh, Usually the verses that immediately precede and follow uh, our passage. Now, as I think we've seen in all of these videos so far, uh, uh, the way really fully to understand effectively to understand what's involved in these various aspects of method is actually to see examples of, uh, of, uh, of these things applied to the text. And so we want to go ahead and look at a, uh, the detailed observation of uh, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. So uh, uh, take a moment uh, to read this passage itself. Uh, And again, consider the kinds of things that you might note uh, with regard to uh, uh, to this uh, passage. And um, we will bring up then the detailed observation of uh, James 1, 5, through eight. We want to do this, of course, in a very uh, method transparent way. Okay, uh, I, th- I think it's actually a helpful thing to begin by making observations pertaining to the passage as a whole. And passage as whole observations are typically either contextual or structural. How does the passage as a whole, in this case, Uh, verses 5 through 8, relate to the immediately preceding and following uh, verses, and and how is the passage as a whole, in this case, verses 5 through 8, structured? Do something uh, something like a survey of just verses 5 through 8. Well, in terms of contextual uh, observation, we, we might note that 1, 5 through 8 may relate to its immediate context in terms of instrumentation. That is, the witness described here may be the means of of dealing positively and effectively with trials and temptations as set forth in the the, uh, uh, preceding paragraph, verses 2 through 4, and as set forth in the succeeding paragraphs, verses 9 through 15. This may also involve an element of generalization and particularization, The general description, by that I mean, the general description of wisdom here may be spelled out given particular, um, uh, given specific content, particularized in terms of the specific manifestation of wisdom in responding appropriately, that is to say wisely, to trials and temptations in verses 2 through 4, 
and 9 through 15, and related to trials and temptations to the perils of both wealth and poverty in verses 2 through 4, and again, verses 9 through 15. The reason uh, that I suggest that wisdom may be the means here is that he emphasizes that wisdom is a gift of God. And he may be suggesting then that this, that this divine gift uh, provides really the possibility for the kind of human response that he demands in the surrounding context. Now, uh, beyond that, also, uh, in terms of uh, passages, whole observation, this is, has to do with the structure of uh, the passage. We note that verses 5 through 8 may be structured according to causation with the recurrence of, ins- of instrumentation. Now, uh, it's always important, of course, to explain fully what we mean by this. That is, verse 5a, if anyone lacks wisdom, is a basis or cause. The uh, lacking of wisdom is a basis or cause for two exhortations. If anyone lacks wisdom, and because that person lacks wisdom, therefore, let him ask God. And, verse 6, let him ask in faith. Because of the lack of, the lack of the wisdom should cause a person to ask God. That has to do with the direction, by the way, of asking. And to ask in faith, which is the mode of asking. The direction of asking, ask God. The mode of asking, in faith, not doubting. Each of these exhortations... Uh, then, is followed by a substantiation, a reason why the exhortation should be obeyed. Let him ask God, who gives to all men generously, generously and without reproaching, and it will be given him. Let him ask God, in other words, because God gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and because the wisdom that that person's need will be given to him. And the exhortation in verse 6, let him ask in faith with no doubting, then the substantiation of that, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, will receive anything from the Lord. So we say, it begins with, the, with uh, the, you have here the cause. If anyone lacks wisdom, that's a situation. By the way, this also involves kind of a problem, so therefore interrogation, problem solution. The lacking of wisdom is a problem that is solved or addressed by uh, by fulfilling these exhortations that he goes ahead to give. So, but anyway, the effect then are is the effect of this lacking of wisdom is are these two exhortations: ask God with an emphasis upon the pray e, say the one to whom uh, prayer is made, uh, with uh, and really the direction of prayer with substantiation, as we just saw, because God uh, gives to all persons generously and without reproaching, uh, and it will be given to that person. And then the second exhortation, let him ask in faith, that's positive, not doubting, a manner of really involves uh, the prayer uh, here, the prayee, divine, the prayer, the human, uh, and the manner of, manner of, uh, of prayer, uh, uh, or the mode of prayer, uh, in faith, not doubting, and then uh, goes ahead and substantiates that exhortation. The reason you should do that uh, is because, uh, without doubting, with, with faith and without doubting, is because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, will receive anything from the Lord. So this is really the, 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 the structure of this of this passage, you can see then how it all how it fits two together, and how the details now of uh, verses five through eight, uh, each of the details fits in terms of the program of this paragraph as a whole. Now we go ahead then to work through the passage uh, verse by verse and within clauses, clause by clause. We note that verse five begins with the causal statement: "If anyone lacks wisdom." Uh, this statement is actually a first-class conditional statement. Whenever you have if, you have a conditional statement. This is a grammatical observation. 
Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, uh, this is kind of a technical expression, but uh, uh, it's, it's not hard to understand. In a, in a conditional clause, uh, the if clause is called the protesis, and the then clause is called the apotesis. And there is always a, there is always a causal connection be, between the protesis and the apotesis. So the if clause is always cause, and the then clause is always a fact. And of course, that's uh, what you have here. Uh, um, now, uh, it goes ahead then with the subject is anyone. We note um, uh, any one of you. Uh, this contains really elements of inclusiveness. Uh, um, if any, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, uh, so it's inclusive scope. Uh, it, all, it contains, of course, the word any at the, uh, at the same time, which really, uh, if any of you, uh, but at the same time, there's an element of restriction here. If any of you, if any of you lacks wisdom. So what he said, that, so, so this really pertains specifically to the readers, whom he has described as my brethren in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brethren. And as persons who meet various trials, verses 2 through 4. Um, so the point here is that, uh, that, that he may be referring specifically to Christians. Here, if any of you Christians, you brethren, lack wisdom. Uh, this may also indicate an expansion over against the subject of verses two through four, where he talks about where he uh, talks about those of you who encounter trials. So, although verses five through eight may relate, in some ways, at one level specifically to those who who encounter trials, this business of lacking wisdom perhaps is not restricted uh, to those who encounter trials. Then. Uh, the situation of the person here is described as lacks wisdom. The reference to lack here connects this statement with verse 4. This is a contextual uh, observation. Notice verse 4, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom. So you really have a, a kind of a contrast here between lacking nothing versus lacking wisdom that you may lack nothing, but if any of you lacks wisdom. Also a particularization, uh, lacking nothing, comprehensive, and now he talks about lacking one specific thing, if any of you lacks wisdom. Now the object of this lacking, of course, is wisdom, which may relate to the recurrence of deceived language in verses 16 through 27 that we observed in the segment survey, Especially that, of course, it appears in verses 18, 22, and 26. We may have a contrast then between wisdom and deception. And, of course, it may also stand in contrast to know, verse 19, know this, my beloved brethren. Now, the first exhortation in verses 5 through 8 is, of course, let him ask God, which is substantiated, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching and will be given him. We note that there are two emphases in the exhortation. There is, first of all, the request, and there is, second of all, the person appealed to. These are logical observations. You have two issues here, request and the person appealed to. With regard to request, let him ask. This, point, this points really to the means of receiving. Asking versus other means of receiving, and the manner of asking, which is actually suggested by the inflection of the word here, especially in Greek, which is a present tense, let him ask, that is, present tense, possibly the progressive present, let him keep on asking, continue to ask. And then the person appealed to is God. Let him ask God over against other possible helps. Now, the substantiation here is really twofold, involving both the activity of God and the result of prayer to God. 
you recognize these observations as logical uh, observations. Of course, substantiation is a structural observation, but we're indicating that, this, that the two-fold character of the substantiation involves two issues, the activity of God and the result of prayer to God. With regard to the activity of God, you note that he moves from general to particular here. He says that he is characterized by giving. Now, in terms of contextual connection, this will be picked up later in verse 17 when he says that God gives all and only good gifts. Here he says in verse uh, uh, 5, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching. In verse uh, 17, he will say, every good endowment and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. As I say in verse 17, he will say that he gives all and only good gifts, especially the good gift of the word, which makes all other spiritual good gifts possible, which raises the issue of the relationship between wisdom and the word. In other words, in chapter 1, there are two things that God has said to give, wisdom and the word. This, by the way, uh, uh, reinforces our suspicion that we, that we set forth in the survey of the segment uh, that, that, that wisdom is a means, is, is, is a divine gift which is a means for fulfilling the demands in the first half of James 1, and the word is a divine gift which is a means for fulfilling the, the demands in the second half of James 1. Now, we note here also that he moves then to the particular. Uh, he says... Uh, who gives, and then the, the, the particular description of God's giving. And this involves really uh, scope, first of all. Who gives to all? Who gives to all, he says. And we, here we note the relationship to the inclusive scope of anyone. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously? So there's no... Uh, there's, there's no exclusion with regard to there's no exclusion with regard to God's giving. And the manner of giving is stated both positively and negatively. Again, these are logical observations. Positively, he gives to all generously. Now the word here is actually in the Greek is hoplos, and it, the RSV translates this as generously. Uh, and insofar as it may mean generously, it, it stands over against stintingly. Uh, that is to say, he is, uh, he is, uh, uh, he is uh, extravagant in his giving, generous in his giving, not stinting or holding back at all in his giving. Uh, this pertains to, may pertain to the extent of his giving. It may pertain to the attitude of his giving. And incidentally, this again is picked up in verses 16 through 18, this business of, uh, of the extent of his giving. Every good endowment and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. By the way, note in verse 17 that the giving of God in that passage involves, again, both extent and attitude. Every good endowment and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, that's extent, and then attitude, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change of his own will. Again, attitude, his commitment to giving. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Now, we note here also, though, that, uh, that uh, then in terms of there's a contrast between the positive, generously, and the negative, without reproaching, over against reproachers, and he may have in mind here the wealthy in verses 9 through 11. So he may be uh, introducing here a contrast between God and the wealthy. Both God and the wealthy have capacity to give. But God gives generously, uh, whereas, uh, uh, whereas uh, 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 he may have at least an implicit contrast uh, with uh, the wealthy. Also, we note that there's no object identified here in terms of the, of terms of the gift given. It's not clear whether the writer is here speaking of God's giving generally or specifically of his giving wisdom. In context, in other words, you might think uh, that when he says, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, he means who gives wisdom to all men generously and without reproaching, but he doesn't really explicitly 
qualify it that way. He may be talking about giving everything to all men generously and without reproaching. Now, of course, uh, the description, the, 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 this exhortation is substantiated, substantiated not only in terms of the description of God's giving, as we've mentioned, but also the result of asking God. And the result is the assurance of receiving. It will be given him. Which really is, of course, the, this is the result. It's causation. The result, the, the result of asking is, is receiving. Uh, but, but you also, that you have kind of a historical causation, but you also have a kind of hortatory substantiation. Um, uh, the reason why you ought to ask God is because the result will be so, will, will be so good. It will be such a positive result. It will be given him. <clears throat> now, he goes ahead and uh, in verses 6 through 8 with the second exhortation here, which has to do with the manner or the mode of asking. <coughs> now, the second ex- exhortation, as I say, has to do in this paragraph, involves a manner of prayer, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. The RSV suggests that there is an element of contrast between this exhortation and the preceding one. Notice um, the first word in the RSV in verse 6, but, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. They understand uh, the de, which is a very weak ad, uh, connective in Greek. They understand the de to be adversative. That is to say that there's a contrast between what was said in verse 5 and what he now says in verse 6. But let him ask in faith. Now, if contrast is present, it is at the point of sufficiency. That's a logical observation. That is to say if but ought to be here, if there's a contrast between what James has said in verse 5 and what he goes ahead to say in verse 6, it, 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 it is at the point of sufficiency. It would be a matter of his saying, it's not sufficient simply to ask God. Let him ask God, but don't think that asking God is sufficient. It is also necessary to ask God in a certain kind of way. It is not sufficient simply to ask God, but one must ask God in a certain way that is in faith. This may also stand in contrast to a possible false inference from the preceding, namely that all that is needed is to ask God. That it's all a matter of asking God, it's all a matter of God, we play no role in it at all. It's all dependent upon God's attitude, it doesn't depend at all upon our attitude. In contrast to that false false inference, false conclusion, he is correcting that by way of contrast by saying, no, a human attitude, human stance is, is important as well. Now, the concern of this exhortation is faith, and the writer emphasizes this concern through recurrence by contrast. Positively, he says, let him ask in faith, and then negatively, not doubting. Oh, the contrast is between the positive and the negative, in faith and not doubting. And, of course, not doubt, uh, in faith and not doubting really amounts to the same thing, so you have a recurrence here of, uh, of that idea. As a matter of fact, he goes ahead to say, not doubting at all, exclusive scope, without any doubt, no hint of doubt. Now, possibly this exhortation to pray in faith is a result, the effect, of the description of God's gracious activity and of the declarations regarding the results of prayer in verse 5. Be- in other words, because of who God is and because of the assurance of receiving what we ask of God, therefore, the proper mode of asking God is one that involves faith in God, trust in God. In other words, God is worthy of our trust because of who he is, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and because of what he does towards those who ask him, it will be given him. Because God can be trusted to answer and to give, therefore he should be trusted, precisely and specifically in his role as giving one, faith in the God who gives generously and without reproach. Moreover, this reference to doubting, 
may be related to the false notion that temptations come from God in verses 12 through 15. Always trying to make connections here with the context. Because in verses 12 through 15, what you have is doubt regarding God's goodness. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot, for God, uh, cannot be tempted with evil, and he, am temp- in, and he tempts no one. may also be related to the deception that good and perfect gifts do not come, do not all come exclusively from God, verses 16 and 17. You see, this may, as I say, this may connect with the notion of, of doubt here, may, may suggest what exactly, exactly what he has in mind with regard to doubt in our passage. That there is a shadow of turning, uh, that, that there is a shadow of turning with God, that he is ambivalent in his giving, that he stands both good and evil. Those kinds of notions those kinds of suspicions with regard to God may be what he has in mind here with regard to doubting. Now, the substantiation really is twofold, uh, involving both the character of the doubter and the result of doubting. By the way, you note the parallelism here. The first exhortation was substantiated by the character of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and the result of of, of, uh, asking God, and it will be given him, here, the substantiation uh, uh, of uh, not asking in doubt involves the character of the doubter and the result of doubting. With regard to the character of doubter, uh, in terms of identity, he who doubts, and uh, I'm working with the Greek here, so this is actually the present participle, uh, the one who is doubting, and again, the present tense may suggest a habit or a, a continuous uh, a continuousness of doubting, but also in terms of condition. And this person then is described in two ways as being double-minded, dipsukos, which may literally be translated double-sold, double-minded, which may involve the element of internal struggle. Again, this is a logical observation. What kind of issue is suggested here? Internal struggle, double-minded, opposing forces that work within the person and unstable in all his ways. Note, again, the word all points to inclusive scope. Unstable in all his ways, which really involves a generalization in relation to verse 6a. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. That is to say, without any doubting uh, pertaining to God's commitment to giving. Here he says, though, that that, that, that such a person is unstable, not simply in terms of doubt regarding God's commitment to giving, but is unstable in all his ways. So, as I say, it involves generalization in relation to verse 6a, for doubting there is described in the context of prayer, and especially prayer for wisdom, but here the doubting person is described as unstable in all his ways not simply pertaining to prayer or prayer for wisdom. Now, this reference to unstable may stand in contrast to steadfastness, verses 3 and 4. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its, um, its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Uh, and also with endurance in verse 12, blessed is a man who endures trial, and may stand in continuity with the passing away and the fading away of the wealthy, verses 10 and 11. Let the rich boast in his humiliation, because like the flower flower of the grass, he will pass away. So will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Now, uh, both of these conditions really stand in contrast to God as presented in verse 5. God is single-minded and unwavering in his generosity. Whereas this doubter, uh, by way of contrast, um, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind and is double-minded and is, is actually double-minded and unstable in all his ways. God is single-minded. This person is double-minded. God is unwavering in his generosity. This person is unstable 
in all his ways. Now, um, in terms of comparison, though, there is a comparison here between the person who doubts and a wave of the sea. This is an explicit comparison. The person who doubts is like a wave of the sea, he says. A person who doubts is double-minded and unstable, even as a wave is driven and tossed by the wind, which perhaps suggests an unpredictable and uncontrollable force. The inflection of, of, is passive here, indicating that these waves are, acting, are acted upon and respond to a force outside themselves, like, like, uh, like a wave that is driven and tossed by the wind. The wave is acted upon, even as this person, by way of comparison, may be acted upon by force outside of himself or herself. Now, the result of doubting is receiving nothing from the Lord. This, of course, involves causation. Because the, 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 the cause is doubting. The effect is receiving nothing from the Lord. Because one is, who doubts is double-minded and unstable, driven and tossed like wind-driven waves, therefore, that person should, must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. We note that there's a double contrast here with the preceding verse, each dimension of which involves really a tension. <clears throat> There's a contrast between the affirmation that God gives to all generously and without reproaching versus this declaration that certain ones will not receive anything from the Lord. He has said, who gives to all generously and without reproaching, and now he says, oh, with regard to this person, he doesn't give. There's also a contrast between faith and supposition. In the earlier, in this, in this exhortation in verse 6, he says, let him ask in faith. But now he says that a person who doubts is like uh, a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. There's a tension here then between faith and supposition. Faith to receive is contrasted with supposition of receiving from the Lord. Now, the, in the inflection here is, of course, a present imperative. Again, this may suggest, this is in the Greek, uh, which may address an inclination towards supposition. In other words, uh, do not have an attitude of supposition towards God, really toward presumption, which must be warned against. The writer moves from the specific of wisdom to the general anything. Let not that person think that he will receive anything from the Lord. James has been speaking of receiving wisdom. He now speaks of receiving anything. So uh, those are some of the observations that can be made, the detailed observation here of these, uh, of these uh, uh, three uh, well, actually, four uh, verses. Uh, this is a, a, a decent place to pause. Uh, we want to, when we come back, we'll look at the second alternative, an alternative to a detailed observation, which is a detailed analysis, really a kind of tracing the thought or a thought flow of, of a smaller passage. This is Dr. David Bauer in his teaching on inductive Bible study. This is session number 11, segment survey, James 1, and detailed observations on James 1, 5 through 8. Mm -hmm. 